Rob's late bringing. Do you want this to reflect rehab? That's what he's coming to talk about. Yes. It's about the it's about the Right, but it's about the, the rear issue. So it's still about the budget? Yes. Okay. Um, all, right. all right, are we on the record? We are on the record. Okay, Michael, can you just join us up front here? So we have, um, this afternoon, we're, I think we're coming very close to um, the language on this apology for preventing the spires, uh, and spires failures. Yeah, sterilization. Um, Michael, if you could just walk us through. I'd be happy to change you, and I'll note the changes. Yes, go through these. Uh, first, for the, for the record, Michael Chernick, Legislative Council, and this is a revision to JRH 7 that you heard the first version of earlier in the week. This is the eugenics apology resolution. It's 1.2, Michael. This is now, yes, this is now 1.2. First clause, I'll read them and uh, indicate where I made changes. In the first clause, I add, whereas in 1925, UVM zoology professor Henry Perkins established that the discredited, that's your first change from dubious, eugenics survey of Vermont, this is new language to measure evidence of defective, delinquent, and deprived behavior, and the balance in this survey targeted members, the balance of the clause is the same. The second clause is a clause you may want to stop and talk about for a minute. The first half is the same, the General Assembly adopted. But for the purpose of, and I know you were all working on different language, and this is what I came up with for the moment. For the purpose of eliminating from the future Vermont genetic pool the tendency towards defective, delinquent, and depraved behavior. If that's what you want or don't want, but I had to come up with something at least for this round, and that's what I came up with. Moving on for the moment, whereas this eugenically inspired legislation resulted in the sterilization of Vermonters, often without that's the same as it was before. Uh, whereas now here are several new clauses. Where this is the first of them. Whereas in conducting the eugenic survey, the survey the surveyors were granted access to case files from state agencies and institutions, and the files were made available to police departments, social workers, educators, and town officials. I split the new clauses, it was too much for one clause. Next clause, whereas as a result of the opening of these files, children were removed from families, institutionalized, parents were incarcerated, family connections were severed, and the sense of kinship and community was lost. And whereas the devastating impact of these eugenics-inspired actions on the lives of the sterilized individuals and severed families was irreversible, the one change there is I added and severed families. The last clause remains the same as you saw previously. Uh, the resolve clause, though, has changed, as is the title, that the General Assembly sincerely apologizes and with humility, expre uh, humility expresses its sorrow and regret to all individual Vermonters and their families who were harmed as a result of state sanctioned and uh, state sanctions eugenics policies is an extra and in there that shouldn't be there. We'll get rid of that. State sanctioned eugenics policies and practices and that after adoption, the title of the resolution be amended to read, Joint Resolution Sincerely Apologizing and Expressing Sorrow and Regret to All Individual Vermonters and Their Families Who Were Harmed as a Result of State-Sanctioned Eugenics Policies and Practices. And that's where I stand right now. Uh, I appreciate the, lang the shaping of the language um, uh, in that line 16. Uh, page one. Um, thoughts from anyone else? I'm not good. <clears throat> Lisa? I just still don't really think humility is the right word, but I, the rest of it is great. Um, that's always up for debate. So. <laughs> I included humility at the direction yes, of the committee. Absolutely. Yes, I understand <clears throat> that. John? Um, I'm just two tiny tweaks, I think. Um, when we say defective, delinquent, and depraved, I think those should be in quotes, because weren't there those words from the studies and not from um, us, really? They may have been. I, um, I, I, I guess I that, that they were the three Ds. Yeah, mm -hmm. the three Ds, right. So, so I, I think because those words like 
Who's, I think putting it in quotes makes it that, that they, they were saying this. No, uh, it's got an origin to like the right. So it's not, it's not us saying yeah, it's this. not us saying it. Yeah, no, 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 I get your point. Yeah. So you, am I, am I being directed to put quotes there? I, init, I know there was discussion, but I initially didn't because we generally don't put quotes unless I'm actually quoting something gotcha. per se and attributing it to the quote. In um, some manner, where did the three Ds come from? Um, is it from this act of for human very, betterment by voluntary sterilization, or was it, it from may, the book, the the Breeding Better Vermonters book? I don't recall. I mean, I could look. I have the. I probably should have brought the act with me. It, I have it in my from office. The act. But it, I can't attest to that without actually having the paper in front of me. Yeah, it was Nancy Gallagher. Yes, yeah, okay. she said that, but we don't know where she got it from, whether yeah. it was her book or the original act. Yeah, I agree. So it would be, it would be lines uh, 10 and 11, and then again, it is... Uh, and then I repeat 17. it a couple of places. Yes, 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 so anytime it's... Right, and then uh, just right. a other, one other slight thing. So am I being directed to add quotes there? Um, it's just a minute. Yeah, hold on. Go scroll back up, please. To the, who's got this? Um, I think I, I putting quotes around it in that in, on line sixteen I, or line seventeen. I think would infer that it was coming directly from the act itself, and I don't think we know that. So perhaps a suggestion might be so called. Putting the word so called. The purpose of eliminating the, uh, I'm sorry, the genetic pool, the tendency toward so-called defective, delinquent, and depraved behavior. I could, uh, Mr. Chair, what I potentially do on that score is I can tell you once I get back, it'll take me all of about two minutes to pull the book off the shelf and determine whether or not it came from the act. Mm -hmm. If that helps. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, it would. It'd be powerful as quotes, and but so-called would work. But and, and then that would be the that would be the default that you could add on line ten as well. Measure evidence of so-called defective. So so-called if it's behavior. not in the mm -hmm. act. If and that's just in, that that just I think is a blanket or an umbrella statement that that's that's what it was described as. If it's in the act, then I'll add quotes. Is that, yes. that seems to be the direction I'm getting. Yes. I, 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 Am I hearing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so. Okay, that's that's easy yes. for me to do. It's no problem okay. whatsoever. Then my second tweak would be on page two, mm -hmm. and it would be lines four and five. Four and five. Okay. I, I just I don't know the history, but how I read this is children were removed from families that institutionalized. Parents were incarcerated. Weren't adults also institutionalized? I think it was just children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I might just say children removed from families. Comma, parents were were individuals uh, people, were institutionalized. Or institutionalized. How about individuals? Okay, more, mm -hmm. um, yeah. From families. individuals, institutionalized includes to me incarceration. So I, if or we could add it, but it, it I think it covers a lot. I mean, it covers most of this. So that's all. I so you would take out the it parents then goes and were incarcerated then goes. Or you could say individuals were institutionalized and incarcerated, or incarcerated. Families and from families. I mean, the children were incarcerated mm -hmm. as well. I mean, they were institutionalized as well. I mean, there were both of those terms in there. Institutional, at least if I may, Mr. Speak, uh, Mr. Chair, um, when I think of institutionalized, I tend to think <coughs> they were sent to, uh, to Waterbury as opposed to the state prison. Oh, right. Yeah. Or, or, or Brandon. It was Brandon. Yeah, or Brandon. Or Brandon. Or Brandon. Or Brandon. Or Brandon. So how would it be if I did the following? <laughs> Children were removed from families, comma. Individuals were institutionalized or incarcerated. Uh, family connections were severed and the sense of kinship and community was lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? That's good. Mm -hmm. I will make That's that change. Okay. Yeah. And I will correct that uh, extraneous conjunction in the first result was. Do we want to make that an institutionalized and incarcerated or? Or incarcerated, I or think or is what That's what you said. Or, yeah. or. You think so? I think so because you're trying to deal with two different, yeah. those who were sent to Waterbury and Brandon and those who ended up in prison yeah. may okay. not 
whether they were one or the other. Now, it's possible that somebody, unfortunately, went through both, but I think you want it to be an or, okay. not an and there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Certainly seems stronger than what we got. Yeah. Initially. Strong. Well, this language is based upon the discussions yeah. I heard on Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. Or whenever it was, we last had this discussion. I think it was Wednesday. Some other 24 hour section of our week. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. I was only here 13 hours yesterday. <laughs> Um, so John, scroll down again, just down page two a little bit. Okay. I see a, I, I see a hyphen in there, like going on seven. Where? <laughs> Where are you referring to? Yeah. Line seven, seven. The devastating. It's a proper hyphen. It's eugenics, eugenics inspired. Eugenics inspired. Yeah. I will. No, keep it. No, I'm going to ask the editors one more time if it belongs in or out, and I would, as I told you previously. Uh, on questions of hyphens, I refer, I, when it's language that I feel strongly about should or shouldn't be, I have a conversation with the editors. Don't always win, but I try. Uh, but in the case of a hyphen, I defer 100% to the editors. That's fine. I, I mean, and so whatever you see in the next version, it's whatever I was told from the editors. It should be. My personal preference is eugenics inspired rather than eugenically. Oh, no, it will be eugenics inspired, yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll leave it eugenics inspired. That. Um, and let's just put humility on the table. Is that okay? I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I asked for it to be included to see how it, how it read and how it, how it felt. If it's not, um, if it's, uh, if it doesn't work on, by consensus with the committee, then, then we can delete it. I think my objection to humility is that it's the act of being humble. And when you look into the definitions of being humble, it's all about making yourself a, the smaller person or um, making yourself insignificant in comparison to others. And I'm not sure that's what we're really trying to convey here. We're trying to convey sincerity and regret. And I'm not sure that humility covers it. So that word is still sticking in with me. <clears throat> thoughts? Other thoughts? I so am I leaving it in or out? Oh, yeah, well, well, we we have that's what we're chewing on. I think it was more powerfully without it. Myself. Stronger. Mm. Calls less attention to us. But Right, so this is, this one example is like letting, what is being an example of humility? Letting someone ahead of you in line when you're in, a, they, you're in a hurry, but you're letting them ahead, or cleaning the bathroom in your office even though you own the company. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's as not cutting firm. it for me. Yeah. No, there's, there are, there are no, other I, definitions. the definition doesn't yeah. have a statute. Well, there's, there's for. a, right, I mean, again, it's kind of a situation that has a bunch of different, enough different definitions to, um, uh, again, I believe in, I, I was, I was also clicking through and was flashing back to the college days of taking a Catholic philosophy course where, Catholic humility is actually not a respect, you know, it's just not one of, it is on the level of, of, of um, ways of being, but it is not, I think it fits more in the category where it calls too much attention to oneself. So I, let's just say sincerely apologizes and expresses its sorrow. Is that satisfactory? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, let me, it's better. I think it reads mm -hmm. better. Could you just give me a second? Let me make sure I have it correctly now. Sincerely apologize and expresses. Okay. It's gone. It's. Do we need its sorrow? Or the, that's the general summary. S -s sincerely apologizes and expresses sorrow. In your I put in the its because it seemed to be. Could I leave that to the editors? Mm hmm. I'll put a question mark over it, and I'm going to ask the editors. 
Headers always make things better. Yes. I, I'm the one that I will take responsibility for putting the word in. It's I thought it was necessary. The editors left it alone. But I will ask the editors again whether they think it's extraneous. And we default to whatever they say. Well, can you scroll back down for a second? Yeah, of course. Higher up? No, the right on line 16. On which page? Are you on page still? On page, no, two? Page, oh, page, page two. Page two. Yeah, line yeah. 16. Is that and supposed to be there for states? No, I had already mentioned okay. earlier Sorry. that I was cognizant that it was an extraneous. Somehow it was in there. We didn't catch it, and it's already crossed out in my draft. It will disappear in the next draft you see. Sorry. <laughs> it is extraneous, yes. So, committee, where are we at with this? Are we satisfied with the wording of this bill and mm -hmm. with the changes that are made? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, we won't vote on this today. We will vote on this next week. We are going to have another session where we've invited um, members from the affected communities to come and speak if they would wish. Um, and we then, part of this process will also possibly include, and, and it may require a piece of further um, legislation. We talked about, we talked about, um, I don't know if making, making amends is again not the right phrase, but it's just the idea of being able to do the next something. And we've talked in the committee about a Truth and Reconciliation Commission as a possibility. Um, and I, when I look at, and then, and then when I look at, there's bills re requested by um, as priorities for the Adenaki through the Native American Commission. Some of which are on our wall, some of which are in a different committee. And I don't. I think that I've, I'm coming. I'm coming along with this as saying that the apology stands alone. Like there's nothing to be attached to this, even though it's a bill. We're not going to put in a resolution, oh, a resolution that we're going to work on this, 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 and this. But the idea of also methodically working down um, what is it that we can do, and I think a Truth and Reconciliation Commission is is there is legislation that we can consider that we have on our walls. Some of which we've heard, some of which we haven't. Um, but getting this idea of a reconciliation commission is actually there's to me it's a two-step process. It's a well, who would we put together to even decide what does a truth and reconciliation commission look like? Like that would be our role, and then enabling that commission to do work. And. Because I, because we have to take a half a step, more than a half a step back. We can't be on that. The government should not be on a truth and reconciliation commission. Or is that's my impression. Um, I envision just, and this is all out to to Imagineer now. But the idea of having another organization, whether it's an academic institution or some other organization that would host this um, in some way. But I, but I keep coming back to, well, that should be something that a, that a study committee of some sort puts together and makes a recommendation as to what it should be. Um, and in terms of timing and everything, it just becomes a question of what is it that we can do that's next, that either co coincides with this or that follows this up in a way that expresses our bona fide effort to move forward. Um, so that's. It, and so I wonder, and I apologize for being here the last time that we talked about this, but I wonder if we could have, have a line in here that indicates that, um, that forward movement. So, um, uh, it encourages the establishment of a committee to examine next steps um, or of action or um, that, uh, I think that's the closest I can kind of get, or, um, or does kind of get a step closer to that language of, of setting up a committee to 
analyze what next steps are, so not even using the words truth and reconciliation, but saying... Like identifying the intent of taking it and continuing and, action. Yeah, and so if we yeah. look at the, the parallel of the UVM letter, that in their apology letter they said, and we, we, will, we are setting up a committee to examine renaming the library. Well, if I may, Representative, you could certainly have that type of language, but you couldn't say we are doing something mm -hmm. specifically because this is only a rest. Yeah. Something to be supportive of, you absolutely mm -hmm. could do. Yeah. But you can't, other than, as I always remind everyone, other than to address uh, the internal operations of the General Assembly, you can't use a resolution to take a, a positive mm -hmm. and structural action of that sort. That has to be in a bill. So, so again, that, that nod towards setting up of... Um, and that can be, cannot be done, I'll ask the question rather than make a statement, can that be done either through real legislation mm -hmm. that we... Oh, propose, through real legislation. No, I'm just saying yeah. from our purposes, you know, if we, if we follow up, again, we are allowed to do a committee bill, mm -hmm. um, we can that establishes what the, you know, again, establishes what the next mm -hmm. steps are. That's, um, we can, uh, I mean, because we can include, in when we write our budget memo, we can include in our budget memo, we expect there to be this situation, but we have no way of saying, I don't think between now and crossover or a week after crossover, which would be if we got dispensation on something mm -hmm. like this, to determine who would be in that kind of commission. Is it the Vermont Historical mm -hmm. Society, again, is it UVM who hosted the eugenics survey? Well, that's not a great look necessarily, but it might be. Um, NVU has a, you know, in Johnson, Johnson has a tie to the, has, has a professor there who's, who's been a very active part of the Abenaki academic community. Um, Middlebury is hosting uh, language less, you know, language study. Mm -hmm. uh, th th there may be any one of a number of organizations that are not the state of Vermont government, but we have we have yet to contact them. Mm -hmm. You know, we have yet to contact um, historians or 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 others who would be able to manage and manage what are the points of the commission. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's also the practical thing of, you know, which wouldn't be addressed in here, where the speaker might say, the bill that's in Fish and Wildlife that would allow fishing licenses, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is that something that we can pass out in good faith and, and not just as a SOP? You know, is mm -hmm. it something that we're, is, ad is addressing their, their priorities? Mm -hmm. Is place names? Mm -hmm. um, Repatriate. We have two bills that came to us very late: repatriation of lands or sacred areas. Mm -hmm. Those are very different kinds of discussions and can't be decided in four or six or eight weeks. Um, well, and there's bills uh, currently in other committees about um, not allowing the uh, sterilization of people with disabilities because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's a, something that continues. So I mean, there's. When we, we frame this bigger thing, it, there's I mean, a lot of things that are going on mm -hmm. around this that are pertinent. Mm -hmm. this. So it's a question: How do we forward this? Yeah. Um, and Michael, I'm, I think I'm hearing from Michael that it doesn't have a place in this resolution. Well, well what's, the, no, what's different to what Michael was saying is that we cannot say we can establish it, right. but but, um, but that within a resolution framework we can indicate. Our encouragement. Support. We can indicate our intent or support, yeah. um, and that's that's what I ha I've heard in our discussions of that we have we have this clear intention mm -hmm. of not just apologizing but taking an action, but an appropriate, mm -hmm. um, well uh, testimony embedded and fleshed out action. And so I, I wouldn't want to uh, indicate a particular action because that that not only is it beyond the scope of the resolution, but it's beyond our, our time. Yep. And I, uh, I think that apologies have um, more meaning to them when there is the, the indication of, uh, of an action beyond the apology. I, while you've been chatting, you may have noticed I've been scribbling. Mm -hmm. And this is really rough. But the, the general, as an additional resolve clause, because I think this is where it would go, that the General Assembly recognizes that further legislative action is required to address the aftermath, which may not be the right word, 
the aftermath of the state-sponsored eugenics policy, something along that line? I don't like required. I don't like to bind people in the future. To Advisable? Maybe necessary. Uh, a follow up to should be considered. Should be considered, should be considered. Should be considered. Yeah. that maybe. Um, yeah, should be considered. Should be considered. Yeah. That's not binding. Right. Well, it's right. an interesting thing, that Tom, is I because I don't really know about truth and reconciliation conditions. But if you're saying it has to be independent outside the legislature, yeah. and if that's really the way, and I think you brought up first round, that's the way we want to go. Our committee can put a study bill out calling for that, right? And we can have that as a study committee. Uh, but is that, I don't know if that's quite about legislative in there. And that's what I don't know. Well, the legislative mean to set a stu to establish. A, if you decide you want to establish a committee, it's still going to take a bill to establish it in the first place, okay. regardless who's sitting on the committee yeah. ultimately. Or right. where the committee is. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, later on in the spring we'll be clear what what is the next step that we want to take. I think. And so, playing devil's advocate, I will just ask the question: Does it? Does that? Um, does that strengthen or weaken the whole apology? I think it strengthens it. I think it makes a statement that we as a legislature are not sure this goes far enough and that we would like to consider moving forward on other research and development or research that would yeah, I guess my question is, do we? I mean, we're not only addressing the Abenaki. Right. First of all, I think that's right. where we are addressing the whole community of people mm -hmm. who are involved. The Abenaki are a very important part of it. Yes. And they, as I was, just had a part of my lunch with the head of the Native American Commission, and she all expressed this continuing distrust mm -hmm. of the government. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and of course, we can say what we want. I mean, this is an extraordinary step. We're taking an extraordinary step here simply by apologizing. The question is, are we going to promise something we can deliver, or is it something we can't deliver? And we can't, we can't bind, on one hand, we can't bind a future legislature to say, oh, I suspect that if we're all here next year, we're going to do something. That's, there's no weight to that, but if it is so, is it by including this into a document that will, at the very least, live in the white books, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this, if, you, if this passes both houses, it will go in the white books, yes. So that's a stated, that's about as deep of a stated promise as we can do without taking action on anything. Mm -hmm. And if we have a limited ability to take action, this year, I mean, we can we can advocate within the building to pass a fishing license bill. We can consider a place name bill, things that will require work and, and, and study. But, um, but what is it along the lines of building a relationship with the communities that have been affected? You know, will is so what we proposing for this mm -hmm. is that sufficient? That's my question. Is the is anything that we can can we put anything in here that expresses future actions or future intent that will be sufficient, truthful, meaningful um, in this document? And, and that was kind of like what I was thinking was like as much as I feel it's important to address like future action, mm -hmm. the limitations of the language we can use in this doesn't make it look kind of like benign words. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, will it be person? We understand what we're trying to convey. Mm -hmm. But are people reading it going to maybe read it almost as like an empty promise, even though it's yeah. not? You know what I'm saying? Because of the nature of the language that we are forced to use in the context. Mm -hmm. I'm just throwing that out as a yeah, thought. Yeah, echo Matt. I don't want to make hollow promises and then have these communities that have been affected say, well, you know, you promised you would do something, but you didn't do it. I, I don't like empty promises, so I would 
shy away from making a promise. And, and you can't in the structure. <clears throat> so it's not. That's, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, you can't. No. So it's, right. it just would sound. Well, I think. And, yeah. And, what about along the lines, though, of recognizing, again, we recognize the Abenaki domains on a state level. Mm -hmm. We don't do it. They're not allowed yet to be a federally, and they may never be a federally recognized um, bands. They just the way that our mm -hmm. federal laws are. However, there is this idea of sovereign to sovereign relationship that happens specifically with the federal on a federal level, is there a way then, or would a less hollow thing say that it's our intent to um, foster better, some, some kind of sovereign to sovereign type, that, that may not be the right word, but some type of relationship between, because the Abenaki in particular view themselves as all native Natives do with as as their own, and so it's our it's a relationship which we've clearly destroyed over the years and tried to make extinct. But you know, is there is is that a way to go that that we want to foster a better relationship between these groups that have been damaged or you know, and I don't know if that's the right way to go or not, or if that's. Um, or if that's for a verbal apology you know, during a ceremony. Mm. Um, there are still people alive who are locked in random. I mean, it, so, so I think not for that because it, it's, it, this apology is owed to so, including all of these people. So I wouldn't, I would hesitate to do that as a way to, um, because it, it's, you know, I, I know people in their 70s who were locked up in Brown. And sitting with them, just unbelievable, and they try to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I think the statement, the, the point of this was an apology. And I think that we have done a very strongly worded document here, which absolutely stands on its own for the intention that we had. I think to go any further, it, it would muddy it, I think. It would muddle it. And to, and to proceed in some way in, within this resolution, no matter how it's worded, could be interpreted as um, a quasi-promise. Even if promise, the word promise is never used, even if it, it's the, it, would be, um, it would be the intention of, and we don't have any, we don't have any um, power over that, any future things. So what I do think, though, to do, um, to do a study to see what the appropriate, um, how this appropriately could be studied further, well, by whom, I should say, uh, to strengthen that position, the resolution could, in that regard, I think, straight, strengthen the position to do something further. Can I explain that right? Well, and I, and I think, Mara, in terms of the, the um, uh, language that, Michael, you offered, could legislative action could include a study. And so I think the, the vagueness of what Michael offered in terms of capturing our That was a really rough yeah, yeah, 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. so like the, you know, we'd have to actually wordsmith and like da da da. Yeah. But in terms of um, what, what you were just saying, Mariana, of oh, maybe a study of what the appropriate thing to do is um, would really be in that and really looking at, and I, even saying a study, I think, is beyond the scope of what we could do in a resolution. But but no, I'm not saying no. I'm not saying mention the study in the resolution. Hmm. I'm saying that do leave the resolution the way it is. But we could make a recommendation for a study. Could we? We not? could do a bill. That would have to okay. be a bill. That have right. to be a separate okay. bill. Okay. And then so this is action over words. I mean, do mm -hmm. we want to put our? Do we want to put in action? Do we want to put into motion? 
you know, there are very few solid things that are out there in terms of what, uh, uh, in the case of the Abenaki, that they have requests for that are part of priorities, just like any other constituent, that there are things that we can act on or not. But I think what is the, act? I mean, I, think, I guess going back to the beginning of this conversation, what is the action we want to take next? And if the action is a committee bill that forms a, uh, that forms a committee to determine what a, a reconciliation commission would be, it could be a committee that determine, to, could determine what all the next steps are going to be, you know, to work more closely with the Native, to, to create a list of priorities. Is it, is it the longstanding Native American Office of Native American Affairs? Is it simply place names? Is it, is it fishing uh, rights or fishing permits? Uh, whatever it may be, and just that could be the roadmap that well, follows wouldn't, this. Wouldn't that be the purpose of a study committee in order to look at all the different? Yes, things? yes, we would. We would be putting something to, right. We would putting yeah. something together that that suggests that there be a committee right. that issues a report on what the next steps would be. Um, in terms of in terms of any uh, what's practical, what's next, but it would be, um, and then of course we have because it would then have to take a bill. F further things would have to take a bill form. We'd have to act on this in the next legislative session, whether they were individual bills or um, that had to do with specific priorities, or if, whether it's for a larger commission, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, yes, Randall. Um, so yeah, I'm interested. I'm really interested in this discussion, and um, like I get the empty promise thing. I guess there's, and these are both overframing them. I don't think that what has been suggested was an empty promise. Um, so we're kind of looking at an empty promise versus a hollow apology, and neither one of those are fair framings of the two alternatives. I don't think either one of the, I don't think anybody's suggesting a hollow apology or an empty promise. But just just to frame the the polls the, the polls in it. Um, I just, I've had to do, unfortunately, a lot of apologizing in my life, and um, usually um, it's helpful, <laughs> I have found, that um, if you acknowledge that the apology is not enough, I just don't know within the framework of a resolution, I mean, I think that's part of what we're struggling with, is that I think we all agree that it's not enough. How do you word that in some way? Because I don't think that weakens an apology to include some kind of language that acknowledges that the apology isn't enough. I think it strengthens it because you're saying we're apologizing and we realize that we're not, that apology isn't going to just allow us to sort of wipe our hands and move on. But we, we may not be resolvable in a resolution to kind of put that, put that piece in there. And I guess, it, it, the, so the question again is, is it something that goes included um, is it possible to include it in the, the apology, the resolution, or is this the verbal, I mean, cause the vision I would have of what this ceremony would be is a reading of a resolution followed by the words of the people who are signing it, so the lieutenant governor, the speaker of the house, maybe the president pro tem, who then issue the verbal of just being able to say, yeah. we know this is not enough. <laughs> yeah. And even a speaker promising something isn't necessarily everything, but it's a lot more powerful in some ways within the confines of the ceremony. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, I think that would be a. That's, this is, that's a balance yeah. between trying to get everything we can into something and then just saying, but if the, the, if the apology is just the apology, and it stands by itself, is that okay for that? And then again, what do we follow that with? Right, yeah, it doesn't have to be embedded in the resolution right. itself, as long as that gets expressed, whether it's in the resolution or out yeah, there. Yeah, I would envision yeah. that there'd be an official statement yeah. done, and again, and, and if, if eventually, you know, again, who would read this, who would say something afterwards on behalf of the General Assembly, and the three people are the Lieutenant Governor, the Senate Pro Tem, and the Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. um, the executive branch is a different, is a different, would be a different place to be. So I'm thinking that this would be done at a joint assembly. Could be. But and everything could be journalized in terms of the words of the people who would be. Um, put it be it the governor or the lieutenant governor, whoever, in or, in, to convey that 
that the, the apology is not stopping here, that there are other. Right. That's. And that's so, that's part of this that you know that that gets into that a level of stage managing what the ceremony will be, but I think that's included in I think that's no, I think that's fair. I think that's that's however we journalize record, it. There's a written record then somewhere of what is said at the ceremony by people in power. Right, and just to, to, to point out the the unique quality of what we're trying to do, you know, I think I asked Michael um, or I might have asked, I, I don't know who I asked, it might have been Bill McGill as well, but just the notion of, okay, this is a bill. We pass the bill, the Senate gets it, they pass the bill, all right, but we know it's a resolution that's meant to be read in public and then commented upon. So what is the mechanism? Is it a joint session where, is it a joint session where all 180 of us are in the room and then rather than having the dignitaries who are usually out of governor's speech sitting at the page, in the page area in the well of the house, perhaps it's families of those, I mean, it, it, it's right. a unique circumstance. We haven't done anything like that before. It doesn't mean we can't, but it's something to figure out. But I think, of course, Procedurally, if I may, without taking aside one way or the other, of course, but just procedurally, if it's something for an extra joint session beyond the usual joint sessions to happen, you would have to need the buy-in of the leadership of the two houses. That yeah. Oh, what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's it's a it's a joint. I'm, not, specu joint I'm not speculating what the answer would be or how. But I'm just simply saying that you would, as a first step, need both the speakers and the pro tems. Uh, buy into it and agree an agreement to schedule it. Yep. Not necessarily the not the lieutenant governors because it be the pro, from the Senate side that would be the pro temps call. Right. I just include him because you know, he's a signatory on the resolution and he is the he is when we are in joint session he, he is presides, the, yes. he presides. So um, yes, those are all things to be talked and worked through and, and our leadership is aware that this is a unique I won't even Overqualify it, but it's just—it's a unique situation um, to this body. And overdue. so, yeah. what's that? Overdue. You need them over. Yes, that's my piece. Of it. And so, the, but that's that, like. So I think we just talked about a great number of different ways of of what's important to us as the committee getting to this point. But we will also bring in, we will also bring in, um, again, families of the individuals who are directly affected and make sure that that's okay, you know, to make sure that we do our, another listening session, um, that, that we make sure that anything that we do or say here or the way that we would present it is not offensive to anybody, um, inadvertently in this case, at this point. Um, and make sure that what we do is correct. And I, I think when it comes to an apology, taking on whether it's empty or hollow is really up to the recipient of that apology. I and mean, we have to present it as truthfully and as honestly as we can. Um, and I think to Randall's point, I think it's true. It's it, acknowledging that an apology is not enough is, is, uh, is, is an important personal and humanistic thing. That is um, that should be part of the that should be part of the whole thing, Mr. Chair. Now I'm a little bit uncertain. Am I including something? I'm hearing comments in both directions, and I'm not gathering a consensus whether I should be adding an extra resolve clause or not. Or another option, if I may, just suggest I can create something outside the document, and then next week, all well, of you can decide whether or not you want it. It's your call, obviously, completely. Um, John, you have a comment? Like, I, I feel like we had total consensus on what we shaped, and it's this one concluding phrase or this one phrase. We can look at it, and if it's included, we just strike that phrase. We're not going to be our, we, we have everyone love this, and we, we just want to make sure this hits the right tone or not. So it's really this one phrase that. So, Michael, I would say if you could just draft that at sort of the end of that and look at it next week. I would draft it separately. Separately? Okay. Just draft it separately, not to, I mean, I would like to be able to say for today, I mean, it sounds like 
if I can sense if I even and we don't have to, we're not voting on this today, but it sounds like by consensus we are happy with the language as revised right. today. And it's corrected the last half hour. Yeah. And Correction. so that if we move forward, I mean if you can draft a whereas that's separate that Well can I mean, think it'd be a resolve clause is what you want, not a whereas. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's fine. Um, <clears throat> and just keep I'll it, bring it on a keep separate it piece aside of paper. and just we have until Wednesday before we will hear from folks on Wednesday and we will presumably, unless this blows up somehow, have a vote on this on Wednesday, um, perhaps as late as Thursday, depending on how we want the calendar to go and, and all that other scheduling stuff. Um, but, but again, to, you know, this, that would be just the next step. Again, we would take this onto the floor, but, but we would make the final decision on that language. What I can do, Mr. Chair, is the following. In addition to making these various little changes that you discussed, I will create a separate document with that one clause. When I submit it back to email it to Ron, I will send it as a separate document, and then you'll have it, and then you can put it up and decide whether or not you want me to paste it into the document itself. Okay. Did, or change it, whatever. Did the, um, when it came to the question about sponsors, is that something we still need to check with Bill McGill? Uh, you did sign the list. You definitely signed. Yeah. That may be a typo, but I think I was thinking about this more. You need to have a con you really need to have a conversation with Bill. That's fine. I did check yesterday into the file, into the list right in here, and you and to reconfirm this, uh, so there's no misunderstanding whatsoever. Actually. Chip thought they had signed too, aren't No, you didn't sign. I didn't, I know. No, no, Representative Stevens did oh. sign. I'm now looking at the sheet. I signed something. Well, I don't, I don't, I'm looking at the sheet right now. You're, you're welcome to look at it yourself, I, but yeah. I believe you if I'm not on the list, but I signed, right? Not this. It's I not, signed something handed to me by Kate Webb, so, um, Anyway, I'll talk to I'll talk to um, the clerk. And you better see what you signed up for. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me. Yeah, this is definitely the right sign sheet. Okay. No way. This is not the right. That's for the repeal of Act 46, isn't it? No, 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 no. Just this the is not the. <laughs> this is not the right sign sheet. I signed that <laughs> twice. I will figure out what's going on, but this is not the right sign sheet. Um, hold on again. Yeah. Yes, you did sign. I, t I take it back. I take it back, my apologies. Kate Webb's tired. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I apologize. Uh, Representative Toriano, you did not sign, and no. that I can confirm. When I was looking, the reason I had the moment of hesitancy and concern, there were two pages to this uh, sign sheet. There are two separate uh -huh. sign sheets, something that we generally try to avoid in the yeah. council mm -hmm. because of exactly yeah. that type of situation. But they're stapled together, and Representative Stevens indeed did sign the top page. So, uh, so speak to Bill McGill. I will. All right. Um, Maybe perhaps he can create a new original. That's what I was hoping for. He told me he could put it on electronically, but not at, at my name, at least, because it wasn't on the side. Well, that's because, yeah, yes. but rep in the case of Representative Stevens, he right. did sign, yep. and you can tell Bill that I have the sign sheet with your signature on it. Okay. Proof positive. Yeah. Um, are we good with this for now? All right, thank you. Please. So, Michael, yeah, you will be ready to go next. Week. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I could have it to uh, Ron sometime on Tuesday. That's fine. And then on Wednesday, we will have um, and I will whatever write, witnesses that are coming And I will in. be here at 1030 to do any final drafting that you changes you want. 
or just to read it, go through it one more time, and then you can decide on that alter uh, additional clause whether or not you A, want to have it at all, and B, if you want me to make further changes to it. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks. Thank you, right. Thank you Michael. So, Eric, the microphone is yours. Thank you um, very much. Thanks for your time, folks. Uh, for the record, Eric Monica testifying on behalf of the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. And yeah, I really appreciate the time as you uh, folks are looking at um, your budget recommendations to folks next door, realizing that there are a lot of constraints, but also I want to make sure that you under um, have a full understanding of what we see uh, out there as, uh, as the needs. Um, and I'll just, to, there are really quite a few places in the budget where housing appears. You've heard from other witnesses about a number of them, and so some of this will just reinforce and refer to, uh, to some of the other witnesses that you've heard from. Um, but there may also be some things in here that you haven't, um, that I'm going to mention that you haven't had a chance to spend a lot of time on. Uh, so I want to make sure that, uh, that, that they're, they receive your consideration as you're looking at the budget memo. Obviously, priority number one for us is creation of additional housing of all varieties. And the way we do that is through the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. We heard multiple times from Jen and Gus um, at VHCB. Uh, our A number one priority is to get more um, uh, capital, small c capital dollars, bricks and mortar dollars, uh, to create new housing, to renovate, to create permanent supportive housing for people with uh, multiple needs. Um, and as well uh, to address some of the infrastructure needs in mobile home parks, uh, which I'll go into in a moment. Um, I know there's a lot of discussion downstairs about a second housing revenue bond. Uh, there's traditionally been a lot of discussion in this committee about full funding for VHCB and how VHCB is not getting uh, what it's supposed to be getting on this, under the statutory uh, formula. All I can say is however you all decide, VHCB really needs a major new infusion or additional infusion of funds. Um, I don't have to, I don't think, convince you folks that we have an ongoing affordable housing crisis in the state. And it ranges from people with multiple needs that are homeless or have mental illness to folks who are working poor to folks who are working at regular jobs that simply can't afford housing to people who are trying to get into home ownership that can't afford home ownership. Um, and VHCB supports that full spectrum of need. Um, so however, um, However it comes about, whether it's through a bond, through additional funds, all I can say is the current need as the bond, the last bond that you all um, approved is, run, is basically spent, uh, we're going to start falling further behind uh, again. And it's and just to be clear, when you say VHCB, you are the Vermont the Housing, Housing and Conservation, Conservation Board. Board. Right. Sorry. Um, okay. Sorry. You're talking about the Vermont Housing and Conservation Fund, specifically. The, the, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, yeah. I'm sorry, is there a distinction I'm missing? Yes. The money goes to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Fund. Right. Which that funds the HCB. funds the projects that the HCB yeah. does. Yeah. Okay. Just wanna, yeah. It's just a clarification that this is not direct funding to VHCB. This is direct it's, it's a, it's this a funding special to fund that provides money to, right. for matches for housing projects of all kinds, conservation projects of all kinds. I just want to be clear that yeah, it's not, no, sorry not funding for the end. directly. This is a fund for them to manage. Right. Yeah. right. Yes. VHCB operates and raises money for administration through maybe through some of these fundings, but through it's, but they don't do pro this is but this money, the property transfer tax, specifically goes to the housing and conservation fund. The trust fund. Yeah. Yes. And it's a special uh, it's a special fund within the states array of special funds, and that's what funds the work that the HCB does through state dollars. Obviously, they, as you heard from Jen and, and Gus, they receive some federal funds that they match with that as well, uh, and their state funds help leverage that, as well as the federal tax credits and, and, and so forth. So yeah, that's, thank you for the clarification. Um, I was kind of, you know, using budgetary shorthand. Yeah. Um, so. Um, 
So one aspect that I know you heard a little bit about is mobile home parks and the statewide infrastructure uh, needs and other issues that mobile home parks have um, at, at the state. Uh, I wasn't here for Gus and Jen's testimony, so I don't know to what extent they were actually able to get into that, but we have uh, convened the Affordable Housing Co Coalition, uh, convened a, a group uh, to focus on mobile home issues over the last um, six to eight months. Uh, based on a, um, a needs assessment that the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board commissioned by a private consultant looking at all of the publicly funded mobile home parks in the state and looking at their needs. And what was identified as a result of that consultant's uh, report, um, and again, this is limited to the uh, mobile home parks going back 30 years um, to the late 80s to the beginning of, uh, of VHCB, um, that VHCB has funded that are in either nonprofit or cooperative, um, resident cooperative uh, home ownership. Um, so over a three to five period, a three to five year period, there is an unmet need uh, for infrastructure improvements that range from water and sewer improvements to road improvements uh, to replacement of aging dilapidated mobile homes to replacement of um, mobile homes that have been abandoned, which there's quite a cost associated with that as well. Um, to, uh, and, and there's uh, one specific park that you did hear from on Housing and Conservation Day in Brattleboro, Tri-Park Mobile Home Park, I believe Kay uh, from uh, the board, board president testified. Um, they probably have the single largest uh, infrastructure needs. They have to relocate a number of their lots that were they were they were impacted by Irene. They're still recovering from Tropical Storm Irene, um, and a number of their um, their lots are in the floodway. Need to be relocated. They're losing. They've lost other lots as a result of Irene, and uh, so they need to prepare additional lots and then uh, place homes there. They also have uh, bridges that were washed out by uh, Irene, or damaged by Irene that need to be replaced and uh, sewer system issues. So um, in order for this, for Tri Park and these other parks that are currently in nonprofit ownership as well as cooperative ownership to remain uh, over the long haul as affordable housing resources, um, the overall needs identified in the consultant study over three to five years is about $30 million with a reasonable estimate of other federal and state resources that could be brought to bear. Um, there is still going to be a remaining gap of about $9 million over the next three to five years to make these parks sustainable into the well into the future. Um, and I'll just say that some of these parks that have been funded by VHCB, sometimes there's a crisis of the park is going to be sold by a private sector owner and the focus is on getting it into a nonprofit or cooperative ownership so that uh, the residents or a, a, a mission driven nonprofit has has that ownership and the park isn't converted uh, to another use and folks potentially displaced. In that process, sometimes what is not able to be addressed is some of the infrastructure needs. So some of what we're seeing here is uh, remaining infrastructure needs that were not able to be taken care of during the, um, the, the transition of ownership. So um, two, one question. Yeah, so um, is there assistance for uh, residents of parks to um, uh, to take over ownership, to cooperate? To cooperate uh, that, co some of that is anticipated in, in the overall needs yeah, that I'm uh, identifying. But this is a large need that is clearly not going to be able to be funded by VHCB's normal annual appropriation, uh, which the governor has level funded in, uh, in, his, uh, in his budget proposal. Um, and so this goes towards the argument that VHCB needs an additional infusion of funds to, in part, help address not just the whole affordable housing shortfall and, and uh, crisis around the state, uh, as, as I've described, but it has a special subset of need that's been identified over the last year uh, for the mobile home parks uh, around the state that we already have significant public funding in. And again, it's not that VHCB is going to do you know the whole amount. There are significant funds. There's agency of natural resources funds that can help with sewer and water improvements. There's uh, federal USDA rural development funds. Part of this package is also uh, the Housing Finance Agency has worked on uh, coming up with an interest rate 
subsidy that could help uh, transition new parks to resident ownership. Um, so it's, it's it, and we could certainly come in and provide greater, more detailed testimony on this subset of issues. I just wanted to make sure that as you're getting uh, into writing a budget memo, um, you know, having heard from uh, from Kay Curtis uh, on Housing and Conservation Day in probably the eight or nine or ten minutes of testimony that she had, just want to make sure that you were aware that there's a larger issue that Tripark is kind of the poster child, I would say, for, um, but it's a statewide issue for mobile home parks around the state. And I'll also add that, um, you know, given that there are uh, is the potential for some one-time investments uh, due to the revenue picture and the, the increase in uh, projected revenues in the January revenue forecast, this is a great place. And like VHCB generally is a great place to invest one-time funds because these are capital dollars that will um, provide investments that will return, um, you know, that, that will provide returns on that investment to the state for, you know, decades to come, um, as with these with mobile home parks. So whether it's, you know, directly for mobile home parks through VHCB uh, or just a, a broader um, special appropriation to VHCB, if there is an opportunity to invest one-time funds, housing and mobile home parks is a great place, a great place to invest those because they're not necessarily ongoing. So just to be clear for folks, your this consultant's report, again, only talks about uh, nonprofits and cooperatives, which is not, would, Basically, my understanding of mobile home parks in general that are owned by nonprofits, like you know, or where, where say Housing Vermont is a partner, it has to be on municipal sewer. It has, to, or there has to be some form of, of, of pretty mature wastewater treatment um, along with water provision. Is that right? They're, they're not necessarily on municipal water and sewer. No, I mean, that's part of the issue with parks is that, you know, many of them were created in the 50s and 60s when there were different environmental standards. And some of them, they have aging infrastructure, and some of that infrastructure has not been taken care of. And also, a lot of the mobile home parks are on are in the floodplains because that's the case with Tripark. Used to, Riverside used to be considered bristle, and people just said, Shh, build them down there. Which, which is the case with Tri Park in, in Brattleboro, and you know when we had Tropical Storm Irene, uh, the mobile home community was probably disproportionately the largest affected community, housing community in the state, uh, from the damages of Tropical Storm Irene, precisely for that reason, because parks uh, and sometimes a part of a park, like in the case of Tri Park or an entire park, is uh, you know in, in the floodway. And, and what happens with Tri Park is every time they have an ice dam. Uh, on um, you know the the river that they're uh, located next to the, the park floods. Sure. So will will there be be the ability to um, renovate water and sewer in these? Uh, as a, that's part of the analysis. Given, it's given uh, their location. Yeah. There's that's part of the analysis. Mm -hmm. Is that um, you know some of the some of the, this nine million dollars of unmet needs would go to water and sewer improvements. Um, in the case of Tri Park, it would go to relocation and preparation of new lots outside of the floodway. Uh, Tri Park's three highest needs, uh, they actually have three parks um, down there. Two of the parks uh, need sewer uh, improvements. Um, and then their third highest priority is replacement of a bridge um, that's an essential transportation uh, connection within, uh, within the parks. And uh, their uh, Tri Park as a whole is about 10% of the population of Brattleboro. Um, it's it's a large, it's about 300, 330 lots collectively. Wow. Okay. It's the largest park in the state. It's the oldest cooperative. Um, it was created back in the late 80s uh, through the efforts of the Vermont State Housing Authority. So and you buy your lot to put your... Um, well, it's cooperative ownership, which is a, a little complicated. Okay. Um, so the corporation owns the land. The corporation yeah. owns the infrastructure, okay. and you lease, as in any oh, mobile home park, lease. you lease your, well, you, you have a share, you're a co-op, yeah. okay. you're a member of the co-op, so you have a share in the corporation. The corporation elects a board, it's a you know, democratically elected board by the residents, the shareholders, and you still lease your lot um, from the corporation uh, that you co-own with, uh, with the other residents. Mm -hmm. So very... Um, you know, we, as a rule in Vermont, regard 
mobile homes as an integral part of the affordable housing portfolio, even if it's to our chagrin at times, but it's because that's what's there. And given the fact that when we talk about very old mobile homes, we're talking about pre-1978, of which there are many. And um, so it's just I just want to give a broader yeah. picture. I haven't seen the consultant's report, or I haven't seen it for a while. I just, it doesn't ring a bell to me. But it is, you know, every 10 years we seem to revisit uh, the needs of this, but this is different. This yeah. isn't. This isn't a. This is a particular revisiting of of a smaller segment of the mm -hmm. mobile home population. Um, um, yes, uh, and there is clearly a lot of background that I'm presupposing here. You know, we spent your committee. You all have been very busy with a lot of. Uh, a lot of legislation, a lot of a, a lot of different work. Um, if there, you know, there is a tight timeline with getting a budget memo out um, and and deciding what you want to put into that. Um, if there is time or work time, we would be happy to come in and, and you know, um, someone from the Department of Housing and Community Development, like Arthur Hamlin or Sean Gilpin, could come in and provide sort of that basic uh, background on you know the uh, extent to which. Um, mobile homes are a huge uh, part of the affordable housing network and resource. They're about 7% of, uh, of the housing stock in the state of Vermont at this point. And we do have one, at least one piece of legislation on here that talks about, um, but, but let's just move yeah. on, but that's that's a larger, and, and you know, it, 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 it's, it, it it's is. a huge vein of, of subcategory in our housing uh, conversation. And, and it would take some time to, you know, fully, you know, get get into this. We spent some time with Senate Economic Development because unlike your committee, I, I know last year you had an update from, from Arthur and from DHCD kind of broadly, you know, setting the context for mobile homes. They hadn't had that, so we were able to spend some time with uh, with your counterparts in the, in the Senate. But, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the report is pretty extensive. It's you know been analyzed in a massive spreadsheet that you know includes I think 87 roughly mobile home parks around the state, um, and it's uh, it's 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 a, a really major piece of work um, assessing. Uh, you know, and the, the parks the represent how what what percentage of the par of mobile homes are in parks as opposed to just on lots? That's a really good question that I don't have at the top of my head. Um, Sorry. Again, another important subcategory of this conversation because yeah. not every mobile home is in a park. Correct. And not every mobile home park is in nonprofit or cooperative ownership. Right. Clearly. Right. Um, so, uh, moving. Moving off uh, away from the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, uh, you know there were a number of areas uh, within the agency of human services budget uh, that have an impact on housing and, and homelessness, uh, and I'll mention uh, a couple of them that have uh, been priorities of ours uh, for the last couple of years. Um, and this gets back to, uh, I know I've been in this committee talking about the proverbial three-legged stool of housing investments. We have bricks and mortar. Um, we have uh, financial, uh, financial uh, housing-related financial assistance, which can be rental assistance or rental arrearage for folks who are in danger of being evicted because uh, they can't pay the rent. And then we have supportive services for folks with uh, the greatest needs that um, can't just, you can't just give them a voucher or an affordable home and expect them um, to, to succeed without, um, you know, without some form of, uh, of support. So those are sort of the three basic legs uh, of that leg, three-legged stool of in, uh, housing investments. And the second and third legs come through the uh, various aspects of the AHS budget. Um, one, uh, and I, I know you heard from Sarah Phillips about uh, this. I, I expect you did. Uh, I was not able to be here for her testimony. Sarah Phillips from the Office of Economic Opportunity I know was here on Wednesday. Um, one proposal they have is for um, an increase to family supportive housing, uh, which a number of our homeless service providers use to support families over longer periods of time in housing. Uh, these are families with multiple needs um, that, uh, again, need those levels of support in order to, um, uh, to, to find and then maintain their, their uh, housing. Long been a uh, priority of our coalition to expand that from the currently uh, currently only serves seven counties, so uh, we would like to see it expanded statewide. Uh, and in the counties where uh, that are currently served, 
Um, there is definitely a, uh, a need, uh, there's additional demand for uh, additional services because of the extent of homelessness, uh, especially family homelessness. Um, their proposal is to uh, remove funding from uh, a program uh, that's run by uh, the one, uh, one Family Center uh, in Chittenden County, uh, and also to take $200,000 from the Vermont Rental Subsidy Program and uh, put it into an expansion. Take medic use that to uh, download, uh, to pair with Medi Medicaid dollars and put that into family supportive housing. I would say generally we support the expansion of family supportive housing. Uh, I'm somewhat concerned about um, the source of the funding. Uh, again, we're in kind of a you know we're in a zero zero sum game. Nobody wants to raise revenues, and um, we don't have a lot of uh, growth in the uh, overall general fund revenue uh, picture. So uh, I see why uh, they're taking from two programs to. Uh, fund another program that um, they're going to get, uh, they feel they can get bigger bang for the buck uh, on that. I know you have a, a, sub, uh, a subcommittee, if you will, um, looking at that, and we've uh, certainly um, spoken to uh, Representative Kalaki, and uh, I don't think uh, Representative Howard was able to be at the, at the meeting. We support the expansion of family support housing, but have some concerns. Uh, over where the money is coming from to do that. And um, the defunding of the one center, um, they're housed in a development that's owned by the Cathedral, Cathedral Square Corporation in Burlington. And Cathedral Square Corporation would need uh, some time to transition. Um, and this is setting aside what's going to happen to the um, young women that are currently being served by that program. It's also setting aside um, who's going to serve that spectrum of need in Chittenden County. Um, so setting those two things aside, at a minimum, we need an additional Cathedral Square Corporation needs some additional time um, to repurpose those seven uh, units um, for a different purpose than for single moms that are uh, on TANF um, and that are um, um, that need additional uh, additional supports. Um, so. Family supportive housing is something that I hope you'll address in your budget memo, and I hope you will uh, recommend an increase. Again, just have some concerns about how they're funding that. Um, the other um, thing within uh, the other program within the OEO budget that significantly serves uh, homeless Vermonters is the HOP program, Housing and Opportunity Grant Program, uh, and part of what um, that, it funds a whole array of different things, but the two things that I wanted to focus on, one is, again, supportive services, and you heard last year for, uh, from um, a variety of sources about uh, federal rental assistance vouchers that were being left on the table and underutilized uh, for spe specialized populations that have supportive uh, service needs. And the reason they're being left on the, t uh, on the table is because we don't have enough supportive services uh, for the families that can't just uh, succeed in housing with a voucher and need those services as well. Uh, both the Family Supportive Housing Program and HOP provide some of those services uh, to pair with both federal and state vouchers so that folks have a greater chance of succeeding and remaining in the housing and coming out of, uh, coming out of homelessness. So that's one aspect of HOP that, um, based on um, the AHS study that I don't know if uh, AHS uh, reported on that report. It was a legislatively mandated report to look at um, the underutilization of specialized uh, housing vouchers and the need for additional supportive services. Um, and so that one of the recommendations in that is for additional funding for supportive services. And two of the conduits would be family supportive housing and the Housing Opportunity Grant Program, both administered by the Office of Economic Opportunity. Lisa? Can you tell me what supportive services are not being funded well enough to um, have families take advantage of these vouchers? Like, what's missing? Is it it's a array of things. for certain programs? Yeah. And what programs, maybe? So some of our homeless shelters um, that provide case management, in some instances, ongoing case management um, for families that are coming from homelessness. 
um, and they may have the, the families may have multiple issues and multiple intersections with the agency of human services. It can they can be you know family that has a member in recovery. It can be um, you know a family that needs job skills. It can be uh, you know um, a broad array of issues. Um, so that's one example. Another example: some of those vouchers are vouchers that are specifically. Uh, targeted for um, chronically homeless individuals that have experienced chronic homelessness and severe persistent mental illness. Um, the types of folks that are uh, served by Pathways Vermont through their Housing First program. Um, so they make very, you know, the greatest possible use of, of federal vouchers, but they only have so much capacity to support those folks. And so some of the vouchers that could be available to them if they had more case management services within Pathways paired with those federal vouchers, um, they could provide, uh, we, we could be housing people who are, are experiencing chronic homelessness with severe persistent mental illness, and also often with co-occurring substance use disorders. Thank you. So families, chronically homeless individuals, I, I think those are probably the two, um, the, the two best examples. And it's not just the homeless service providers, the parent-child centers provide some levels of support to homeless families as well. And, um, and it, it's, it varies by county. For instance, here in Washington County, uh, family supportive housing is not done as much by the homeless shelter. It's more, um, and by their case managers, more by parent-child center. So it's a different patchwork uh, depending on the, on the county um, and, and who is sort of the lead agency in the, in the county for that. Um, and then I, I mentioned Housing First. Um, you heard testimony from Pathways Vermont. And um, so you know, they're a, they have a high success rate with the most difficult to house population uh, in the state, arguably. And again, if they had greater funding, especially in underserved counties. They don't serve Rutland, they don't serve Bennington. Those are two high needs counties that have been identified uh, where Pathways uh, could, um, if they had the funding, uh, could serve those counties and could serve uh, a population that is not being served in either of those counties. And I'll, I'll just anecdotally mention there's a very tragic death of a homeless person in Bennington. Uh, some of you may have seen in the Bennington Banner. Uh, I actually went down to Bennington uh, just before Christmas to meet with the Greater Bennington Interfaith um, group that had a very strong concern about 10 or 15 homeless individuals that were living under a bridge uh, about 100, 150 feet away from their uh, offices. And these are folks that could easily have been served by Pathways uh, Vermont through their Housing First uh, program if uh, it were available in, in, in Bennington County. Um, and the person froze to death. The person froze to death. Under the bridge. Under the bridge. This was someone um, that I, I'm not, I haven't talked to them directly yet. I just got the clipping. Um, somebody forwarded me, Morgan actually forwarded me the clipping the other night. Um, Morgan Brown, whom you heard from. Um, I think it's the individual that they mentioned um, uh, to us who literally had been discharged from the hospital, had uh, you know, an open wound. Um, on uh, on his foot and was walking in the snow, living you know living outdoors uh, with a, with bandages that were getting wet, and um, it, I, I believe it was that individual. Um, so it's, uh, you know these things can be prevented. This is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's a matter of the resources and bringing the resources to bear. So. Um, I, I also know that you have a subgroup that's um, uh, Representative Kalaki and, and Howard are looking at the uh, general assistance emergency housing proposal that the administration um, has uh, brought to you and, and uh, is asking for approval through the budget process. I will just quickly say that there is a broad array of concerns. Uh, we've uh, convened um, uh, homeless shelter uh, executive directors of several homeless shelters around the state, and there is a very strong level of concern. I will say there is a spectrum from, please don't do this, to, well, we'll work with the state to um, make this work at the local level. But I think the universal message is that they cannot operationalize this uh, by July 1, and need uh, they, they need this proposal to basically be um, deferred for a year so that they can work on a regional, you know, case-by-case -case basis with DCF uh, on how to make this transition work so it's not a disaster when it gets rolled out. Um, 
and so how they can, in each of the different regions of the state, figure out what the best local solution is uh, to take on the emergency uh, housing program. Remember, this is the motel voucher program that provides uh, basic, it's a basic safety net program uh, when the weather is freezing cold outside uh, for vulnerable populations or people who have been, uh, who've lost their housing through no fault of their own. Uh, and the um, DCF proposal is for local groups to take over the motel voucher budget and run it on, on their own. And the concern is this is safety net. This is the state no longer um, taking responsibility for this. It'll still fund it. But the big question also is what is the funding level going to be like year to year? And currently there is an existing body of um, rules that have been promulgated over the years by uh, DCF around general assistance, and part of the proposal is to take the housing, emergency housing, out of those rules so that um, there isn't, uh, there aren't firm um, guidelines. There's no firm appeals process or grievance process for someone who's denied the benefits. So um, we urge you to. Uh, um, to, to basically recommend to your appropriations colleagues that this be put off for a year um, so that uh, DCF can work through the local issues with everyone. Uh, but right now, people don't even know who in which area. You know, we're, you know, it's February 14th. Um, the appropriations bill, at best, would be signed by, and finalized and signed by the governor in mid-May, which would give them literally one one month to operationalize this. DCF is saying, we're going forward with this. They don't even have approval for this yet from the General Assembly through the budget process. And they're telling people they have to make decisions by March 9th on who's going to do this at the local level and start operationalizing something so that people at the local level can start issuing checks for motel vouchers out July 1. John? Well, I want to remind you that we all heard from the Washington County mental health person, and she had, I think, a good analysis of some benefits that may come to the county, but then there was all these questions about how is this going to work and what's the emergency. And I think the central policy is currently right now the state is responsible for that final bit of housing and if the, in, in this emergency housing. And if these 12 regions now are getting money from the state and they run out of money in February for hotel vouchers, there's no guarantee of that, and so that that's a policy issue we have to. And this, and I've been talking to folks, of course, in Chicken County, just to see what the impact is. And because Sarah said she was going to get allocations to the 12 different centers, and it's five hundred thousand dollars less than the proposed for the for the Chicken County groups to to get money from the state. So the, the question is. Not that it's wrong, this change is kind of interesting to think about, but I think this transition time, um, and the nonprofits are saying, well, we can't take this additional stuff on if there's not an adequate infrastructure support. And it's not clear yet what the infrastructure support is and what the, all these pressing needs are, because you, know, you can't fund someone level and expect them to take on this new stuff. So um, I, I, I've been hearing, as I've been talking to the different nonprofits about this is some say it's you know like COTS does not think this is a good idea. I was just talking to them and they're a selling a provider in Chicken County. Others are saying, well this is kind of an interesting thing to think about. How do we operationalize this though? And then who's ultimately responsible for this emergency money? Who shelters people in February? And if so um, I, I really hope that we can find a way to encourage further conversation with the administration and the field because it doesn't seem possible to operationalize this by July 1st to take these state programs and give them to the 12 regions and have it be successful. Uh, you know, I know that Sarah presented a first year transition year that did have a lot of motel voucher money still in it, but it's it, then, remember, she said there was going to be a 34% drop in, in motel vouchers in the second year, which is interesting because the money's moved to this more family-centric kind of stuff. But none of the partners, none of these 12 partners have been in conversation enough with the administration to believe any of it because people aren't really sure how to operationalize it. 
So it's not a bad idea, it's just not a fully formed idea. Lisa? Um, I have no comment about whether the delay is a good thing or moving ahead is a good thing, but Sarah did say to us that they are going to hold back money so that next February rolls around, they will have money to release for those emergency vouchers so people won't be left out in the cold. I just wanted for to clear about year. that. Yes. For the first year. For the first year. And, and the I'm these assumed that you were Then the state forgets that the concern is who upon a policy level. Who's ultimately responsible? Are these 12 non are these 12 consortiums responsible uh, for these emergencies that, that happen? Or is right up till now the state has been responsible? Mm -hmm. And now the shift, one of the big shifts in this is each of the 12 regional groups will be ultimately responsible. And the state saying, well, maybe they can better integrate all these services, you know, so we don't lose those. And I don't hear anyone saying, that's a terrible idea. It's like, well, how do we do this? Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm hearing people really are asking for a more thoughtful transition planning in this and to get real input from the, the field about this. That, that's really what I'm hearing from people. So I'd like to just make a comment that this is the first that I've heard that my colleagues on this committee are actually working on outside groups that are crafting policies and, um, shall I say, holding meetings with various stakeholders. And I feel like that information would be very helpful for this entire committee to know as you're going about that process. And I don't know anything about the protocol of that, and I understand it's it's probably political who gets to be uh, in those groups. But to hear the feedback would be helpful. So then when we listen to a witness, we're like, oh, I know what he's talking about. I've heard about that from my, my colleague, John, who happened to you know say at a meeting the other day that this came up. So those types of um, outside conversations don't do the rest of us any great benefit if we're not hearing about them. Um, I would love to hear more about about these issues. So I just wanted to put that out on the table that well, at least I, how many caucuses are we all in? The climate caucus, the women's caucus? No, yes, but I, no there's a specific issue that I can talk to you off okay. about Lisa about it about how these how these things had been assigned um, last year and they probably happened before you joined us. So but I, I would be happy to fill you in on what they are. And um, so, Gerhard, go ahead. I mean, we're going to we're, we're gonna I, I get try your clock. I know. I mean, it's Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. <laughs> um, but to Representative Hango's uh, point, um, my understanding is that that holdback is about $400,000. Okay, yeah. And that's, this, that's what I thought I heard around this, 500000 This year, yeah, um, they went into budget adjustment. Uh, they, they, had, they were over $2 million in budget adjustment this year. Because of the motel vouchers. Because of the motel vouchers. Yes. Yeah, on that <laughs> program specifically. It's actually 2.7 million, yeah. but they had 700,000 in carry forward from last year. So, Thank you. We did hear yeah. that. So, so uh, there's a long history of the commissioner of DCF coming in and asking for more money for this program because they were optimistic that they were going to be able to reduce the, <clears throat> the overall dollar amount for motel vouchers through community investments. Mm -hmm. And we did hear from Mike Smith that something had to change. Yeah. Yeah. I, and there have been efforts before. Anyway, um, let me just move on. The one other thing I wanted to uh, highlight within the AHS budget that really impacts housing um, and your institutions, Corrections and Institutions Committee is beginning to uh, hear uh, a bill called the Justice Reinvestment 2 bill that is being generated in the Senate uh, in judiciary um, that has an array of recommendations around, you know, reducing um, dealing with uh, uh, criminal justice reform, but the part that we focus on is re-entry for folks coming out of prison uh, to have a successful re-entry into the community, and one of the key components in that is housing, um, and there is an appropriation in this bill um, that would help folks who've served their time, you know, 
uh, presumably have, have, have discharged their debt to society for you know, crimes committed. Um, and, uh, are, and we have a significant number of folks that are in prison, have served their minimums, they're nonviolent, uh, and are there but for uh, approved housing on the outside. And so the, the DOC has uh, a transitional housing budget that assists with this reentry. Uh, again, uh, Housing First and Pathways Vermont is one of the uh, conduits for that to uh, help folks uh, re-enter the community, but there are also other things that are funded through that. And so uh, this bill um, is hopefully going to continue to have an appropriation and it won't immediately get stripped out. But I think you know, prisoners coming out of jail need uh, the housing and community supports in order to be able to succeed and, and not recidivate and wind up going right back into prison, costing the state you know sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. Um, that's the last piece in, in AHS that I'll mention. Um, you have already heard from the Rental Housing Advisory Board, which just a reminder, I sit on with Wendy and Sarah Carpenter and the uh, other folks that um, you've, you've heard from and, and seen in the committee uh, on, on that bill. Um, there are a number of recommendations in there uh, that go to budget. There's, um, you heard from Mike DeRocher the other day, there's the fire safety. Um, the need for approximately $600,000 in the first year to increase uh, their uh, both their, their inspection staff and to uh, purchase new cars, laptops, etc. Um, and all of that uh, could be defrayed by a, uh, an apartment uh, registration fee. Although what I will also say here is that for a first year, uh, again, if there are one-time funds that are available to be invested, uh, you could look at this, uh, you could look at that source as a way of funding the first year costs and you could postpone um, the registration fee for years, an incentive for landlords to sign up and register their apartments so they'd have like a, a year, a year's pass. That's one of the things that was discussed at the Rental Housing Advisory Board um, in anticipation of there being the potential for one-time funds uh, available for investment. Uh, likewise, um, there's uh, some funding that would be associated with uh, starting up uh, the statewide database of uh, uh, housing, um, rental housing, and in that proposal also is the governor's uh, Vermont um, Housing Improvement Program, which would provide some incentives. So, you know, if the code enforcement is sort of the, the you know the, the stick, we want to make sure there's a carrot for landlords to improve their apartments, um, which they could do through the uh, Vermont Housing Improvement Program. And then, lastly, that group is also recommending um, an additional additional funding for the back rent program because one of the things that landlords face is um, low income, uh, often working folks or people on fixed income that can't pay the rent. Um, and they are going to be subject to eviction for non-payment and the back rent program, which is underfunded uh, within housing opportunity grant program, it's underfunded and more funds for that could help prevent evictions and, as you heard from Jessica Radboard the other day from Vermont Legal Aid, uh, prevent folks from spiraling into homelessness and, and at greater cost to the state and other areas of the budget. Sure. So um, that budget is, is presently about 800000 is my understanding? Um, I think uh, Legal Aid's uh, proposal is uh, for about $800,000. And that's an increase or that's That would be an increase. The overall uh, HOP program, program uh -huh. which I think you heard from Sarah Phillips on, Sarah mm -hmm. administers this through OEO, is uh, just on, it's around a $7 million program mm -hmm. that includes some federal funds and provides things like basic shelter operations, so rent and utilities and staffing for a shelter, for example. So it's a, it's a very broad program. It also has rental rearage um, that local providers apply for through an RFP process. Right. Uh, basically, uh, you know, a community action agency or a homeless service provider get a share of that. Would, would put in an application and say, here's what we need. We need, you know, $200,000 for rental rearage, we need uh, so and so much to run our shelter, so and so much for the food shelf, and, well, maybe not the food shelf, but uh, so and so much for case management uh, to provide supports to homeless families. And that's just an example. Different regions and different providers right. through an RFP process apply for a broad array of benefits. And if you increased uh, the HOP program with a specific idea towards designating a portion of that for rental rearages, um, that would then go 
to regions, uh, different providers in the, uh, in the different regions to enhance their ability to prevent those evictions. From what I heard, that that's a very successful program, that landlords in particular are, um, you know, the mitigation that uh, takes place in trying to, or the, or the, uh, uh, try, that takes place in trying to uh, pay this, these arrears, because nine out of ten, I guess, people are uh, put out because of non-payment or rent. So when Legal Aid was here yesterday, I had a long conversation with one of those folks, and uh, he talked about how this has worked very well around the community. Yeah. 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 That's the full, that's the laundry list. Do you have it electronically? I can send it to you electronically. Please do. That would be great. Great, thank you. Thanks. I wasn't sure whether you guys were going to have time for me today, so I didn't prepare and write it out. Uh, Thanks. You could send it electronically this weekend, that would be great. I will do that. Thank you. You have all that stuff in your head because I can see it. I know you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, committee. We are going to um, Tuesday. I will be out of the office again. I have to run to Boston with my wife. Um, Chip will be in charge. So vote out whatever you want to vote out. Let's do it. Mending everything. We're going for it. Yeah. Put that wall. Chip, take down the wall. Um, you'll be hearing more testimony on S83. That was that was the reminder today of the split on S83, which is a pretty pretty interesting um, difference of opinion on whether or not uh, that language would be worthwhile. Um, but we'll hear more about that on on Tuesday, and then um, I believe we also have scheduled on Tuesday the um, the gender bathroom bill um, enforcement. Um, Ron, do you have the rest of the schedule? I do. I'll be on the um, So, uh, yes, gender-free bathrooms uh, at 3 o'clock on Tuesday. Wednesday, um, we'll hear concluding testimony on the resolution regarding eugenics, and presumably we'll to vote on that. There'll be um, more discussion on the budget for the rest of the morning on Wednesday. Uh, then in that afternoon, uh, we have a walkthrough with Damien on H428, dealing with collective bargaining, sometimes called uh, car check. Uh, on Thursday morning, um, we're back with at 9 a.m. the Bill of Rights and, uh, to look at language that you have been hammering on. Uh, followed by the uh, recovery bill, the committee discussion on that. Then there's a joint assembly for um, electing trustees from Vermont State Colleges. And then in the afternoon, um, a new bill with a new attorney that we haven't had so far this year. Um, and that's uh, collective bargaining rights for teachers. That's H805. That we'll be hearing a walkthrough and a witness testimony. Friday, please take note we are meeting before the floor at 9 a.m. Uh, for budget discussion. So that's a change. Uh, and then the floor, and then after the floor, we'll be hearing from um, Commissioner Bolio from the Vermont Department of Taxes. And then in the afternoon, um, we return to the recovery residence again. Possibly a discussion in possible I will try to have uh, the beginnings of a draft for the budget panel that will hit on at least not only our comments about the uh, proposals in the budget, but also to discuss um, potential wish list items, some of which, many of which Earhart just covered as well. But um, Precise timing of events, you know, changes, please check. Next week also promises to have more action on the floor than what we've been accustomed to so far this year. We're starting to get uh, pretty 
big bills coming out of committees, and so mm -hmm. be prepared to be flexible on that as well. And members, if you want to track budget-related documents, so you go to the committee information page, you select other documents, and there's a heading there for uh, governor's proposed FY 2021 budget, and anything that's submitted to me that's budget-related sits there, regardless of the date that it comes in. Mm -hmm. So like Sarah Phillips testimony this week, who's there? Mm -hmm. It'll be there under the date that it came, but it's all there. It's all there. Okay. That's the folder it sits in, and that's how you find it. Thank you. So if Earhart sends me something this weekend, yeah, if I post it this weekend, not likely. If I post it this weekend, that's where it will be. Okay. Yes, I just provide one additional. As someone who's followed the budget for 20 years, uh, could say if there's anything else that you want to dig into in the budget, um, you go to the JFO page. There's a, every department, every department head has come in, submitted to your colleagues next door a presentation uh, with their budget, their overview, and within the agency of human services, something that's referred to as the crosswalk or the ups and down sheet, which is basically a spreadsheet of every department of the agency, uh, and it shows what their proposed increases and re decreases are vis-a-vis -vis last year's budget. So uh, it's JFO, the FY21 budget, and all the documents are, are also there. Thank you, everybody. Uh, a lot of really hard work this week. Thank you for your patience and for your civility.